Hey guys, Carl Ryan 7 again. This time I'm going to review of the Warm 44 scale high grade RX 78 Gundam from the original Gundam series. And this is the very first high grade ever released, all the way back in 1990. And there are two things about the box that I quickly want to touch upon. The first thing is that you might notice that there are boxes with and without this sticker here at the bottom left corner. High Grade Gundam Last Shot March 2001. If your box has a sticker, like mine does, it means that it is from the very last production run of this model kit produced. Because, as you may or may not know, after 2001, this last edition, it was never printed again. So if your box does not have the sticker, it is most likely a first edition model kit. So that's also a cool thing. So it might even be cooler to own the box without the sticker or get both of them. And then the other funny thing is that this um, was released back when 0080 was going on. So it reads UNT Spacey instead of Earth Federation Space Forces. And for a while, UNT Spacey was the official designation of the Earth Federation Space Forces, which was later changed because, well, it sounds very similar to the organization in Macross. As you'll notice, not everything about this model kit screams 1990. In fact, a lot of it seems to be from much, much later, beginning with the colors. And this is, in fact, how you get it out of the box. Almost completely color accurate. The first way to achieve this is with um, Bandai's patented system injection molding, which is multiple colors molded on one single part. Not painted on there, but actually molded. And like nowadays, they only do it with the inner frames of the real grades. So you will have yellow and white on this one part. You will have red and white on this part. On the chest here, you will have the red, the yellow, and the blue on there. And perhaps most importantly, when we're talking about 1990, or just 90s kits in general, the chin. We do not get the dreaded chin sticker. It's actually molded in there. Fantastic. And it goes even further, because when we look at the eyes, there's no sticker either. We get the eyes in yellow. This is amazing. All I had to do was to trace the black around the eyes and then they were absolutely perfect. And it just, it doesn't just end with system injection molding, like other little details like the thrusters here on the back. It's overall a great looking machine and out of the box the only painting you really have to do is on the back of the feet they could use a little bit of gray right there. But for a kit, once again, from 1990, that is pretty amazing, really mind-blowing. If you look at some of the later kits, mainly Wing X and uh, G Gundam, you don't get that kind of detail with those kits at all. Then when we look at stickers, the ones that we're getting, the ones that you really have to use is uh, the red one that goes onto the jewel of the V-fin, and then this red one here, which goes onto the crotch area you know, to get that V on there. And then all the rest are just extra marking stickers you can choose to use or not to use. You get these ones that goes over the shoulders, this one goes on the leg, these go onto the boxes on the front and the back skirts, and then some more little arrows you can use whether or not, gray one that goes on the back right there. So overall, in terms of color, this thing is years ahead of its time. In R44 scale, this was really unheard of up to this point and would be unheard of for quite a lot of years after it. On to articulation. And just as with the color scheme, we get some more amazing revolutionary stuff. This was also the first kit with an inner frame. Uh, the same that would later on be used by the high-rate Gundam Mark II, which is the one I'm showing right now. But as you can see, this kit was years and years ahead of its time. This would later on be used, of course, by the real greats and also by the Gundam, the Master Grade Gundam version 1.5, giving this model kit also pretty damn good articulation for the time. The heads, unfortunately, still show that this is a transition from the 80s 
to the 90s. It's not on a ball joint, so it will only rotate around all the way, not up and down. And sadly enough, it's stuck in this awkward, kind of upwards looking pose. It's similar to the statue of the RX-78 II, and granted as a statue it looks nice, but as an action figure, you would much rather have it either looking forwards or slightly down to give it a more badass feel. The arms rotate around all the way. The funny thing is, the right arm on mine has no issues whatsoever. The left arm feels like I'm going to snap it right off if I move it any more than that, so I'm not gonna move it there. And Arms rotate around above the elbow, bent at one joint for 90 degrees, and believe it or not, at this time that was still something pretty revolutionary, because when we're looking at some of the Shark's counterattack model kits, not even all of those could uh, turn around above the elbow. The hands, well, technically they are on pegs, but there is a ball joint in there thanks to that inner frame. So they will rotate around, turn around, and do everything a ball joint does. And if I'm not mistaken, these were also the first ball jointed hands in Gundam, or at least in 144 scale. No waist movement whatsoever because we do get the gimmick with the core fighter later on. Then the front skirts are separate, believe it or not. Legs go forwards very nicely all the way like that. Backwards, not quite as much. And they go out once again very nicely, like so. And it will also rotate around, giving you even more upwards position. It looks a bit funny, but you know, he can do it. Then the knees are on a single joint, not quite 90 degrees. Then the feet go forwards, and believe it or not, here we have the first case of the flip-flop joint. And they go backwards also nicely about that for you can kind of force it backwards further but i'm afraid you're going to snap the joint at that rate side to side unfortunately didn't exist yet so overall the articulation is pretty damn amazing for the time because you also got to keep in mind that there are actually master grades albeit very early ones with articulation that is very similar to this model kit and, of course, I'm talking about the extremely early ones, like the 1.0 Gundam, Zaku, and 1.0 Jim, like the ones from 1995. But still, it's a thing. So, moving on to accessories, and believe it or not, this is where things get even crazier. Now, starting off with perhaps the most disappointing thing of this model kit is, when we look at the beam sabers, these are just dummies. They don't really serve a purpose. There's a peg on here that's literally supposed to peg on there. So these are completely worthless because you couldn't even modify these uh, to hold a modern day beam. So they, you can hold them in the hand if you want to, but that's pretty much all you're going to be able to do. What we do get, however, is a single one of this. And yeah. It's something, he can hold on to it, a little bit. So yeah, let's quickly get rid of this solid beam saber. Because it's one from 9090, I'm gonna forgive it for that. Also because we're gonna get a lot more cool stuff. So let's quickly forget about it and move on with something much better. The beam rifle. Now sure, nothing on this thing moves, but that doesn't make it any less awesome. It fits into the hand relatively well. It's a bit on the shaky side, but so be it. It is an older model kit. And also, the trigger hand is on slightly an angle, which is going to come in very handy for the Hyper Bazooka. Now let's say that you don't want to use the beam rifle. Well, with pretty much any other 144 scale RX-78 II, you'd be out of luck. You'd have to put the beam rifle somewhere. Maybe you're going to lose it. You know where I'm going with this, aren't you? Presenting the shield. Now, by all means, this is a nice standard issue shield, but we do have some system injection molding going on here. I mean, the red and the white, very nice looking. The back is a bit plain, but 
In the front, this is an extremely nicely detailed shield for the time. We even get two extra beam sabers on here. So a total of four, just like the Katoki Gundam. We even have this little movable piece right here so you can move the shield around and you can pretty much attach this thing anywhere. Left arm, right arm, unfortunately we have these very unsightly holes. Ah, really a shame. And even two places on the backpack but what's even cooler is that there's a peg right there and you'll never guess what fits in there there we go isn't that amazing not only can we store the beam rifle there but it also makes the very empty inside of the shield look a little bit less empty at the same time we now have the hyper bazooka equipped which fits into the hand much better than the beam rifle. It really feels like the trigger finger hand was made for the hyper bazooka, including the angle, because this, even putting it in this pose with the hand at a slight angle and the hand being all the way down, you still have to really push it on there and hope you don't break anything. But it works out just fine. The only issue with posing the hyper bazooka is that these beam savers are at quite an outwards angle so like this is just fine but if you want it in a more firing pose you're gonna have to remove this beam saber and then you can pose it because you can see this really gets in the way of where the beam saber would be but you know other than that no issues you just put the beam saber in the other hand but now let's say you don't want to use the hyper bazooka stored so, as far as Warm 44 scales are concerned for the RX-78 II, this is the only one that can store every accessory that it comes with. And by everything, I mean everything. Including the Core Fighter. But more about that in a second. One final thing I want to say about this clamp here is that you might have been wondering why that clamp has been on for the entire review. Did I forget to remove it? Did I forget to switch it out with a covering piece? No, there isn't a cover piece, unfortunately, unlike what we get with um, the other high grades where you have the option. This clamp is always going to be on there or you will just have a very unsightly holder. That is the only bad thing I can say about that. Literally the only bad thing. Other than that, once again, fantastic so now back to our little core fighter here and when i said store what i meant was you can transform this little thing and you go all right this you have to remove but you know as far as transforming goes so you can transform it pull this guy apart get it in just as the real Gundam click it in and there you go I I don't know what to say I just want you to take it in 1990 I just transformed the core fighter on a 144 scale RX-782 put it in there and it works absolutely perfectly this gimmick is just super nice and i also really like the fact that you do get the option to either have it in there or you don't have it in there kind of similar to some of the master grades where you get the choice between either the core block or the actual core fighter so you can still display your core fighter alongside your master grade and really when you look at the core fighter they didn't really have to sacrifice anything on it the only complaint here is that the nose kind of has a tendency to drop down, making it look a little bit less good, but that is because they used uh, pegs on the side rather than you know something more rectangular that would keep it up. So you can even fix this little droop with a little bit of effort. And sure, we have the parts forming that are going on with the tail, but once again, for 1990, this absolutely blew me away just that it was able to do it. Sure, it sacrifices um, the waist movement for it, but once again, that was something in 1990 that War 44 scales, believe it or not, didn't really have. 
I'm thinking back about my jig and did it have it a lot of I can't really think of a model kit that was released before this thing in 144 scale at the very least that had waist movement so I guess it was very natural for them to include this a great feature pretty much an iconic feature for the RX-78 II that would take many many years to be replicated in 144 scale and when you compare this little core fighter to the other core fighters in 144 scale, you will notice that this thing actually holds up very well. I mean, it's just a bit unfortunate about the nose cone, like I've already said, but for example, comparing it to the Hagrid Universal Century version, you could make an argument that this is actually the superior version when compared to the Hagrid Universal Century. Sure, you don't get a landing gear, but in terms of color separation, this thing does do it better thanks to system injection molding. And when you compare it to the real grade version, you will also notice that, well, the old high grade is actually much better in terms of scale when compared to the high grade Universal Century version, because it is somewhat smaller than it, especially when we fold up these wings. It's much closer in size to the real grade version, because of course this thing was designed to go into the Gundam. So yeah, the core fighter is also a very little but very impressive extra thing about the RX-78 II high grade. Then the last thing I want to have a look at is the manual, because it's a pretty interesting thing to look at. For starters, you'll notice that the Gundam on the cover is wildly different from the actual model kit that we're getting. The detailing is just so much more elaborate on the manual. And you know, usually when you look at the cover of the manual, especially with Gundam, you see the machine that you're actually getting. But just look at the amount of extra panel lines. Look at the amount of extra surface detail we're getting. And then just look at the head. Like I said, the manual completely fixes that awkward angle this guy has. It's much more uh, downward looking. And even little things like the chin seems to have been extended. The Vulcan seem to have been drilled out and like just little extra details all over the place. So it's really funny just to look at it. It's like, hey, 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 you could make this thing, but you're only getting this thing. Good luck, mate. We know you can do it. But other than the cover, there's even more interesting stuff to look at inside. First of all, we get these really nice drawings. Here we have the Gundam and the White Base escaping from Site 6, being pursued by, well, supposedly Rigdoms, which are obviously portrayed by Rigdom 2s in this picture, as evidenced by the backpack and also the shoulders. And just some explanations, a lot of explanation going on, especially for a high grade. This is pretty you know, unique. Also, this picture of the RX-78 II. This has to be one of my all-time favorite RX-78 II pictures. Just so nicely detailed, just all the hatches opening up, really showcasing the brilliance of Katoki's design. Unfortunately, this is not the Katoki design, and we still haven't gotten an official Hajime Katoki uh, version of our 44 scale. Anyways, back to this thing, just an awesome drawing. Once again, kind of unfortunate that we're stuck with this guy. We get the core fighter. Huh. The Katoki version of the core fighter. Now you can obviously tell this is a Katoki version, by the way. Uh, these things open up there, and then the way the shoulder armor opens up over there. So yeah, obviously the Katoki version. Uh, some more things. Be mindful, hyper bazookas. Here we have, interesting. The Gundam up now, the core booster, which at the time was released. And come to think of it, we still haven't gotten the core booster in 144 scale high grade. Hmm. Now, really, something I would have expected by now, we do have the Jet Core booster from the X line, and we do have an old version of the core booster, but no modern one. Here we had a fight with the Elmuth, and the Gundam. Oh. No. Oh, wait. So, is this supposed to be during. The fun, because there's a lot of flames going on, but I'm pretty sure that when Amuro was getting up, there weren't a lot of people running around to Gundam itself. Still a very nice interpretation of the scene. I guess it would make more sense that your, you know, top secret, super important mobile suit is surrounded by at least a few people who know what they're doing. 
And here we have what we're actually getting in the box after quite a few pages, actually. Moving on, how to build it. And finally, even more information. It seems like on the final page, we're getting some instructions on how to get ourselves an amazing RX-78 2, which is a really cool thing. I gotta admit, and you know, kind of makes me wish that Bandai would include more of these kinds of things because in older, in other older Gundam kits, I have seen more like tips and tricks on how to build Gundam other than this is how you cut up, this is how you're supposed to cut up the part. Like really telling you like, oh, like, oh yeah, you can do paneling like this and this, or um, even in the first, in one, um, I think it might have been like the first edition of the RX-72 Hyperfinable Century. It even came with a little guide on how to build Gumpla. And here they're like telling you, oh, you can do all this kinds of stuff. And once again, going over the features. So, you know, this is usually the kind of stuff we nowadays see in magazines like Hobby Japan, but having it included with the model kit itself is pretty neat. As always, the inevitable question is, do you want to buy this? And well, there are two answers to this question. First of all, we have the contemporary answer, and then we have the more modern answer. First of all, the contemporary answer is an absolute yes. If this was 1990 and you were somehow watching this on the internet, I would be screaming, yes, absolutely go ahead and buy this for 1000 yen. This thing was simply mind boggling. As far as 144 scales of this time were concerned, this was absolutely bar none. I mean, we had a great buildup of model kits from Sentinel and also model kits from 0080, and this really culminated. This, I would say, is the first modern kit that was ever released. It was the first high grade, and it is absolutely worthy of that name. Even 100 scales of the time weren't as technologically advanced as this thing. The only thing, the only model I can really think of that um, can be on par with this thing, and I would say, well, was slightly better than this thing, was the 100 scale full action new Gundam. But that in and of itself was also way ahead of its time. And that is a word that really describes this thing way ahead of its time. For the first 10 years, like an entire decade, I can't immediately think of a 144 scale model kit that can surpass this. The Wing kits, the G Gundam kits, the Gundam X kits, just pure technically speaking. Maybe you can argue that they look better, but in terms of color separation, even sometimes in terms of articulation, they can't even lay a finger on this thing. I mean, especially some of the G Gundam kits are really bad. Like, really like bricks compared to this thing. So really for 1990, this thing is just amazing on every single level and for 1000 yen this would have been a steal back in the day. Really? If I lived back then, I would just have this model kit in every single, well I would just paint it in every single color variation I could. Shard, the RX-78-1, the RX-78-3, just any other <laughs> machine I could find. Xeon colors, like in one of the Gibbons Greed games where it was painted green, why not? The real type colors, because why not? Totally gray, like a jet fighter, because why not? At the time, there really wasn't anything better in more 44 scale. Nothing. Now, for the modern answer, should you still buy this thing? Because, like I said, it was amazing back in 1990, it was still pretty damn good in 2000, but in 2016, should you buy this? Also taking into account that this is the only model kit that Bandai has come forth and said, it's done. We are not producing this anymore. The only one that they have officially discontinued. 
meaning that the prices of this thing have gone up astronomically. Very similar to what happened to the limited models of like the Leo and the Taurus. So yeah, considering that there is literally a gajillion other RX 78s out there in literally every single scale you can imagine, paying an incredibly an incredible price hike for this thing as cool as it is and as awesome as it is to have a piece of you know Gundam history in your collection just buying it to have an RX-72 is going to be an absolute no it's probably going to come as no surprise but like I said it's an amazing thing to have in your collection and by all means this thing is a collector's item so really, in the end, all it boils down to is that if you're just a regular Gumpla builder, this really isn't something you should go after. It's way too expensive. And if you're thinking about what the hype for this model kit is all about and why it's fetching such a price, well, here's the explanation for the collectors and why you might want to buy this. Well. Like I've said a hundred times before in this review, it held up beautifully. It's a great model kit for the time, the first high grade. So it does have that historical significance. It's like the first real modern Gumpla, the first real modern RX-78 II, and there is just something special about it. On top of that, it's also the only model kit that's been discontinued. So there are a lot of special things going on with this model. On top of that, this is also the first model kit to really use system injection molding. In the manual of the full action new Gundam, it does say that it's using system injection molding, but if you look at the runners, Sure, there's a runner with multiple colors on one runner, but it's the same as with modern kits. You just have the color separation going on. Not really two colors painted, well, painted, not just two colors on one single part, what we would now consider system injection molding. So it's got all of these amazing, amazing historical things going for it. And that is why you might still want to buy this thing as a modern Gumpla collector. And, you know, that's really the key word here, a Gumpla collector. Now, let's just say for some reason they would reissue this thing and it would come into circulation again for 1,000 yen. Should you go ahead and buy this thing? Well, the thing is, we have the Revi version, we have the High Reasonable Century version. Those are also cheap machines and even if this thing was to come back into circulation, it would still be beaten out by these two. I would still pick that thing over the G30 at any day of the week, all year around. Then for some more size comparisons, here is next to some other old machines, the Heavy Arms and the Gym Command Space Type. And really the funny thing is, Gundam really seemed to have like a little golden age around 1990. This thing is from 89, this thing is from 90, and then the Heavy Arms was from like around 95, 96. And in a way, it definitely looks like it's the worst out of the bunch, especially with this giant dirt face head. Granted, the RX-82 also has a little bit of that going on, but when you look at the color separation, it it really shows that the RX-72 is considered a high grade. Then here it is next to the Rose Gundam and the Double Zeta Gundam. And when I said that there were some really bad G Gundam kits, this one isn't even the worst really, but just look at the stickers peeling off of this thing. Pretty horrendous compared to that to the RX-72 or our good Double Zeta Gundam. Just a massive beast. And finally, here is next to the standard size Jim Custom and the always bulky Zaku 3. And that's all for this review and see you guys next time.
One final thing I want to mention is this right here in the manual. It says that the Gundam uses MS Joint 2. Now, I'm not sure if this means that there was an MS Joint 1 or if it means that like this is MS Joint 2, the inner frame, and MS Joint 1 is just like the polycap joints that we're so used to. Because really, I can't think of any other mobile suit prior to this thing that used an inner frame except for the 172nd scale RX-78 II and Char's Zaku II. And the only reason they had an inner frame was because their entire gimmick was showing it off. So, you know, just a little food for thought. If maybe anyone knows um, of another model kit that uses MS Joint, please feel free to leave a comment down below.